Alright. I'm Gabriel Quintero Velasquez. Yes. Give you consent. Yes. Yes, sir. You're in the uh, Promesa Studio at the Avenida Guadalupe Promesa Building. I'm the President and CEO of Avenida Guadalupe Association. I'm also a, an, an old school DJ. I, I've just used my initials, GQ Velasquez, all run on. Little, little letters, yeah. Well, you, you know, I look at it from the perspective of a disc jockey because there's so much music today that you have to categorize music and every DJ is going to be responsible for categorizing their own music. So I look at it that way. When, when, when I think of, uh, uh, of the West Side Sound, for me, it's I'm going to go do a gig and I got to fill a crate full of music. And the West Side Sound is kind of an undefined, scientifically undefined category of music, right? that really doesn't get a definition until you get into the 1980s. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of, um, for me, it's, it's, a, um, it's a phenomenon that was occurring in music all over the world when rock and roll uh, gained its um, access to the world. So as the different places got access to rock and roll, they started to um, uh, kind of uh, relate and put out their own versions of, um, of music. Let's say about, around 1953, 54, 55. And the West Side Sound comes out um, playing the rhythm and blues of the rock and roll period with all of the influences of the Chicano or in those days of the Mexican-American community. So for me, I, I'm listening when, when I'm wondering, okay, what, what goes in this crate that is the West Side Sound crate? I'm, I'm really looking for this, this kind of a really powerful sound of uh, kind of distorted tenor saxophones and uh, uh, this big band sound, right? But that's rock and roll. So... To me, that's, that's what it embodies. It, it embodies the kind of the cultural spirit of the Mexican-American youth, of the Mexican-American community, uh, but that's playing rock and roll. It's playing rhythm and blues. Well, the... the, the um, you know, there are bands, right? And, and I, I think really you don't enter the, the opinion of West Side Sound as a, just as a person, right? As a, you know, when, when you're a DJ, you get requests, right? So you see the people coming over to you and saying, hey, can you play this? And then they, without thinking about it, are telling you what they want to hear because you don't know what the song is, so they start singing it to you, right? Well... To, looking at it from that perspective, uh, the um, the thing that 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 stands out to me is a, is Doug Psalm and and his interpretation of, uh, of of rock and roll, right? So it's a um, they're oldies, but but the thing is that and, and I mean oldies in the classic sense, oldies with a capital O, right? But there's this real strong attack from the vocals. 
so like you know um, uh, you know I'm 57 so like I'm born in 1965 right and uh, that means that all of the adults in my childhood were the kids whose whose sound was the West Side Sound or oldies in general right and um, uh, but 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 knowing that as you're growing up all of the older people around you are singing these songs in the shower. That's all you hear, right? So we're, by the time I'm a teenager, we're, we're kind of you know, living in a pachuco world. And to us, they're called oldies now. But um, the rarest of the rare is the credibility, the street cred you have in, in, in the lowrider culture, right? And Doug Psalm has this song called Why Why. Maybe, I don't know if you've heard it. But it's the way that he starts the song. He, he sings this, why, why, just by himself, you know, and, and it starts real abrupt. But then come in these saxophones, right, or, or, these, or these horns, right, that, that have this real distorted sound. So to me, that is the sound of the, of, of the, um, of the West Side sound. But I'm not so sure that it, that, that, that all comes out of what, what, all of the opinions that I've, that I've heard or, you know, that you've become aware of I don't really buy the idea that that uh, that they were born out of uh, um, kind of a mishmash of things that converged with rock and roll because if if you're familiar with El Indio uh, Isidio Lopez he's got this one song um, a rendition of uh, Sabor a Mi that he does where the horns are real uh Abrupt, real sharp. They attack the notes, but it's a romantic song. So, so it's romantic, but in its conjunto root, in its in its urban kind of Mexican American root, there's almost an overwhelming amount of um, attack, and in, perhaps in the recording of it, there's a distortion that is that is uh, created. For me, that West Side Sound, I think it's horn roots I find in the Silvio Lopez stuff. And um, so, so it, that's, a, that's an important detail to me because when I'm wondering for myself, what is this? What are the characteristics of the, mu of the, of the musicianship and all that? I could very easily include an Isidro Lopez record in that crate, even if it's not rock and roll. But the way that he did his swing in the conjunto world tells me that, well, there's some influences that are not necessarily rock and roll that maybe are more West Side Sound than rock and roll, right? So the rock and roll kind of also addresses not just the music and the way they played it, but the youth of the time, which is not necessarily the music, right? It's the actual personalities. Like there's a story of uh, the Sir Douglas Quintet, right? Um, a good friend of mine was a, a was a founding member of the Sunglows, which which begins that sound right that then becomes uh, the the, um, the Sunliners right and all that, and um, uh, in, in all of that, uh, you you kind of you kind of see that that there's a there's a personality um, that really that really kind of kind of kind of roots itself. In the conjunto, but then when you get to this story of um, you know the the um, the guys in the Sir Douglas Quintet uh, uh, taking on a personality, becoming kind of like like Madonna, right? Like like they're not even who they are anymore. Now they're these British guys, right? And um, so you see that there's a personality aspect that doesn't have to do with the music. It has to do with what are they who they're trying to relate to, the greater, the greater musical market, right? And they were trying to pretend that they were uh, the Beatles, that they were coming out of the, out of the, the British thing. That's a, the Sir Douglas Quintet. I mean, you know, it's blatant, right? There's a whole story where my friend runs over to them and says, hey, ¿qué pasó? They go, no, 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 don't talk to us in Spanish, man. We're, we're supposed to be British, you know? That, 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 you know, that, that you know all of those things that were, that, that they were actually trying to do something else, but they were coming from a different uh, a lineup of music, right? Or a, a, a different tradition in music. So their musicians played certain things. They played certain horns. They played certain... 
So when they did rock and roll, it was like, well, do we just do the electric guitar, bass guitar thing, or what do we do with these horns? Meanwhile, they're supported by Motown, right? I mean, in, in their mind, well, Motown, right? And uh, so, like, if you, if you look at what was happening with our West Side Sound, it's not unlike exactly what happened with the Beatles at the very same time, that these guys were emerging out of a rock and roll, but the reality is they were coming from another thing. And our West Siders were emerging into rock and roll, but they were coming from another thing too, right? Well, I mean, you know, you could almost, you could almost wash music with the word art. Music is an art. And the youth of the 1950s, let's say 1955, let's put them at 15 years old, right? Which means they were 1940 babies, 19, 1941 babies, right? Um, the start of this you know, environment, the very first fundraiser that this area, this area ever had to raise dollars to construct the Plaza Bay was a poster that was donated by the artist Jesse Trevino, who, who went into the Vietnam War a Mexican-American and came out of the Vietnam War a Chicano, right? Who went into the Vietnam War uh, clean cut and came out with long hair, you know? And that's a lot, what, that's what I see, the, what happens with the West Side Sound. I, I do feel, knowing, knowing my grandparents and my mom and my dad and, and, and uncles and aunts, there was a little bit more acceptance of rock and roll in the Mexican-American community, right? So whatever we see as culture in the Mexican-American community, particularly this area, is kind of, is kind of with, a, with a great lot of tolerance with respect to um, their music and, and the music of, of their parents. And I think part of it is because, you know, that culture, the Mexican culture, had a lot of, a lot of kind of cross-modernity in it, you know, through comedy and through other things. So this, this area, it's hard to, it's hard to put it in, in, in the proper context because I, I kind of look at things a little scientifically. By the time you get to 1955 over here, the community here had already been affected by federal um, federal mandates that changed the trajectory of a of a community that grows organically. It had already began begun to to be a, a an area that, um, and I don't know. Maybe that's a maybe that's a process of of the of the whole. Um, um, development of the cultura to begin with because places like uh, Edgewood, um, uh, the, the Minchaca that were way over here in, in um, um, Sarsamora and Culebra that were crossroads of, of, of intersecting communities, although that there was segregation, it kind of forced situations like the Keyhole Lounge, right? That we would just see as a lounge, right? Or as a place people go. The reality is it was a convergence of African American and Latin American or, or, or Mexican American cultura, right? And, you know, it could be that, that maybe that, that those, those, those federally kind of, I, I like to look at them or think of them as restricted communities that you could get in but you could get out, you know? That in there they created that pressure cooker and, and, you know, wonderful, wonderful culture, wonderful music comes out of communities that are cut off because of whatever reasons they get cut off. But it, within, within the context of, 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 of that evolving culture, right? I mean, quite honestly, the West Side Sound does percolate in, the, in that context. Um, yeah, yeah, well, because like, like I'm saying, you know, we would listen to what our parents listened to, right? And a lot of that music wasn't on the radio, 
So it was what they sang, or when they went to the when we went to them with the with to the baseball, uh, what, what would they be the the hamburger stands? It was the music that they were listening to, right? And the bars in the in the West Side, you know. So a lot of these forty five oldies, you know, and you had places that continued to sell the Janies and and the Norteño, these places that still had the forty fives, and then it was an industry, right? So you still had you know, Rudy T, and Rudy T still, uh, you know, still playing. I mean, out of, out of this environment, we held uh, uh, the um, uh, Patio Andaluz uh, uh, reunions in, in the, in the mid-2000s, in the mid-2010s, in the mid and uh, featured Sonny, Sonny Ozuna and uh, the, probably the last phase of the Royal Jesters when Dimas uh, Garza was still alive. You know, so um, at, at, at one level, it, it's an industry that had to become part of our lives, of the music that we listen to. I'll give you one real uh, uh, crazy example, one beautiful example. We just lost Joe Bravo, right? He just passed away. Well, well, well Joe, Joe Bravo, as we were growing up, was recording the beginnings of what would be Tejano, right? Yet, que casualidad, all those songs that, that we would go to the debuts. And you couldn't have a debut that didn't play que casualidad, right? It just was the way that it was. So you have, you'd have to be in that cultura, but then you might not know that little Joe, right? Little Joe Bravo did... did um, um, it's okay. It's like a cornerstone of the West Side Sound stuff, you know. And, and you know, you say Little Joe, people think Little Joe y la familia. No, no, the the oldies, right? So it, it it permeated, right, all the way up until you get to like Al Gomez, Al Gomez or Louis Bustos, you know, or Sauce, or or these guys that while the rock and roll was thing thing was happening. You know, as it evolves out of rock and roll, it, it quickly becomes the orchestra chicana that ends up being the Latin breed and, and you know, and, and David Mares and, and, uh, and Joe Posada and all of these people that become the industry, right? That also become the engineers, right? So, so what, is, what is brought out is that, is that horn, that, that style that stays consistent. It gets a little washed out in the Tejano era because of keyboards and engineering and all that stuff. But, but, but when it goes back to the horns, there's a particular aspect, outcome, that even when you're listening to Little Joy La Familia and the, and the uh, big band Chicano, you still have the, the, the kind of the foundational sound of those tenor saxophones and those trumpets and, and, and all of those things that make our music even different than, well, I mean, we're Tejano, right? So it's different than music from Sinaloa. It's different than music from Durango. It's different. So, so the Texas onda in the Mexican concept, in the Mexican-centric uh, musical reality is that we have our own sound too as a state, but then in a transcultural way, right? Our sound overlaps with the rock and roll of America and to the point that even Mexico's rock and roll, you know, you know, you can go to the Czech Republic, everybody has their own rock and roll, right? But our rock and roll, it really rooted. It rooted in the United States as a whole. It, it, it really gets rooted in the 1980s and late 70s when the lowrider culture takes off. And now you have to have this sound. And everybody's got Sincerely and they all have the Fats Domino and they all have all of that. But you can't, you can't call yourself a real cruiser if you don't have any Doug Song or if you don't have Talk To Me or Golly G, you know. So it almost emerges as a, as a, as a strong subculture on its own of the general um, categories of rock and roll where you have doo-wop and you have, you know, all the different, all the different categories, right? that the West Side Sound really deserves its place in that onda.
the, the West Side Sound, no, well, well, the West Side Sound definitely represents um, San Antonio. The, the, the only thing, the only thing to me about the West Side Sound that is hard to, it's, it's, it's a, it, there, there's a, there's a real band formula. It's not just being from the West Side and playing. It's not just having a band. A lot of those young guys, like I, I can give you my friend from the Sunglows. He was a trumpet player in the high school band. So when you listen to the West Side sound, the horns, okay, you can jump to Al Gomez, who is a very accomplished musician, right? And... And then bring in the Beatles, right? Say the Beatles that, that were not accomplished musicians, but they were incredibly talented, right? And, and that's important because when you listen to John Lennon or you listen to, uh, to George Harrison or even Paul McCartney, you listen to their horn arrangements. The same thing happened with their horn arrangements that happened with the West Side Sound. And part of what I think comes out of the the you know, the kind of backtracking to say, okay, how do we say that there's a sound in San Antonio unless that sound is a sound that is rolling, right? That it's continues and it's got a style. I, I find, I find, I feel that, that a lot of that sound comes out of the high school band sound, right? There's a certain, there's a certain horn that is, that is a marching horn a certain tonality. I find that that is the, one of the most um, mirrored sounds in a rock and roll sound is as if a high school band was playing those horns. And a lot of these young musicians, the horn players, they were in the bands. That's where they learned to play the horns. Um, and became very accomplished Horn members like 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 Georgie Georgie Cantu, you know these guys that were there with Sandy Ozuna and the Sun, well, they were with the Sunglows in their early days, you know. So, it's a sound that most definitely belongs to San Antonio, I, and I think it's wonderful because Califas will try to say hey, that, that 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 you know that they're the home of the right and all that, but the reality is it, it it emerges here, and there's nothing more. No, there's no more proud place to say San Antonio than when describing this particular horn sound that is very big in San Bernardino, Los Angeles and all that, right? So it, 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 it gives credibility to the, to the idea that we have our own sound. For me though, I, I kind of look for where, where's the duplication of it? Where's the new, and there doesn't seem to be that. There's the tradition of having a big band. There's a tradition of playing the horns but I don't feel that there's a great enough understanding of how do you get that sound. Well, you, you know, you, you know, Jeremy, I. As a, as a, I got to answer you as a DJ, which is a little bit more critical. I'm not sure that it does. I'm not sure that it does because there's so much changing so quickly, and 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 the markets are so brutal with the idea that they're not interested in longevity. They're interested in selling the newest product. So in a way, it kind of crush a lot of what got us to this point, right, to where it exists. I mean. There were radio stations like uh, KEDA and, um, you know, Kono. Uh, but there was a lot of radio stations that, that didn't see the difference between a song today and a song 20 years ago played at the same time on the radio now. Record shops, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Well, we like, I mean, you know, audiophiles, right? We like to believe that it's because they discover that a record is a facsimile. It's a, it's a direct copy of the sound itself. A digital file is some guy sitting in a studio deciding when he's got the right sound. A record's not. The bass response in a record, you can't, I mean, there's no way to, there's no way to duplicate that anywhere else but through vinyl. So I like to think that maybe people are on their way to discovering the value.